Hi, I am Katina Horton, the Love and Freedom Toxic Relationship Recovery Coach. And today's teaching is entitled, Four Things His Track Record Tells You But You Keep Ignoring. And the first thing that we're going to talk about that's very important is he hates you, but he's willing to keep having babies with you and his side pieces, right? When you don't know your worth, that you have value, that you belong, you will allow other people to define who you are. And part of that definition they will give you will be what? Undeserving unlovable, unworthy, right? Poor character, ugly, etc., right? And this is why Laban had no problem using his daughter as a pawn in a twisted, narcissistic game of his. And in Genesis 29, 18 through 28, it says what? And Jacob loved Rachel and said, I will serve the seven years for Rachel, thy younger daughter. And Laban said, it is better that I give her to thee than that I should give her to another man. Abide with me. So Laban made it seem like what? Like everything was copacetic. Everything was good to go, right? And then it says, and Jacob served seven years for Rachel. And they seemed unto him but a few days for the love he had to her. And Jacob said unto Laban, give me my wife for my days are fulfilled that I may go in unto her. So it's like, okay, I worked the years, the number of years that I promised to work, right? And now I'm ready for what? My wages and that's my wife, right? Anybody would be ready for that, uh, for her at that point, right? Any man. And Jacob said unto Laban, give me my wife for my days are fulfilled that I may go in unto her. And Laban gathered together all the men of the place and made a feast. And it came to pass in the evening that he took Leah, his daughter, and brought her to him and went in unto her. And Laban gave unto his daughter Leah, Zilpah, his maid, for and handmaid. So it's like not only did he give Jacob Leah, the wrong daughter, not Rachel, but he gives her a handmaid to go along with the package deal, so to speak, right? And it came to pass that in the morning, behold, it was Leah. And he said to Laban, I notice he didn't say anything to Leah, even though Leah was a part of it. He knew that Laban was behind the whole shenanigans, right? The whole thing that exploded. What is this that thou hast done unto me? Did not I serve with thee for Rachel? Wherefore then hast thou beguiled me? So it's like you tricked me. You knew exactly what it was that you were doing, right? And Laban said, it must not be so done in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. Fulfill her week and we will give thee this also for the service which thou shalt serve with me yet another seven years. Wow. So the first seven years is like it wasn't enough, but he had to tell him what? Now you got to serve me another seven years. This was not a fair trade-off, not for him and not for anybody else, right? And it says, and Jacob did so and fulfilled her week. And he gave him Rachel, his daughter to wife also. She didn't have a problem. Notice Leah didn't have a problem going along with this terrible deceptive plan of her father's, right? because she didn't have any self-worth, right? And she didn't see any value in her existence. Her sister was the beautiful one to look upon, right? And when you define your worth by your external beauty, it will mess you up every time, right? External beauty fades over the years, right? And what doesn't is what? Having the evidence and presence of God and the Holy Spirit that is always there. It causes people to look at you and say, you know what? I know it's something different about him or her, but I cannot put my finger on it, right? They know that it's something that they do not have, right? So Leah, she ended up being born into a seed of rejection and a spirit of unworthiness. Her weak eye and her sister's beauty played a major role. 
And in Genesis 29, 17, it says, Leah had weak eyes, but Rachel had a lovely figure and was beautiful. It doesn't say, uh, what it doesn't say, though, is about Laban treating uh, Leah differently as, you know, when they were young uh, children. It does not say that. You can kind of infer, though. I don't think that the scripture would tell us about Leah having weak eyes, Rachel having a comely figure and being beautiful if that did not play a role in their treatment, right? If it didn't play a role in that background story, so to speak, right? And so what happened is that Laban did not protect Leah. Leah protected, uh, not Leah, Leah. Leah did, Laban rather did not protect Leah, but Laban protected Rachel, right? In the end, he ended up using both of them as pawns, though, right? Leaving them penniless from the money he made off of them. It says, then Rachel and Leah replied, do we still have any share in the inheritance of our father's estate? Does he not regard us as foreigners? Not only has he sold us, but he has used up what was paid for us. Surely all the wealth that God took away from our father belongs to us and our children. So do whatever God has told you. That was in Genesis 31, 14 through 16. So Leah's only solution for this was taking her sister's man, then making herself a what? A baby factory for a man who never ever loved her. Jacob didn't love Leah, but he did what? He kept having babies with her, right? And which each with each baby, can't you see Leah going, this time I've struck go. I know this time I've got it, right? And she kept naming her children after her wombs and, and calling one of them saying, you know, maybe the name being attachment. Okay, maybe he's going to be attached to me. Okay, maybe this time he's going to honor me. Okay, maybe this time he's going to love me. Each of her sons, she kept naming after all of her trauma and drama that was going on with Jacob, and in which case she was also a part of, right? She did not have to go along with her father Laban, but she did, right? And so each time she had the baby, it was like, okay, this baby is going to do it. I can feel it. This one is the one, right? But it was never one that allowed, it was never one child that was the magic touch for Laban to stop doing what he was doing in his trickery upon and for Jacob to actually do what? To love Leah, right? And it says, when the Lord saw that Leah was not loved, he enabled her to conceive, but Rachel remained childless. Now, isn't that something? How uh, Rachel was Jacob's number one. Sometimes people say main squeeze, but what happened? She could not have children initially, right? And it says, Leah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She named him Reuben, for she said, it is because the Lord has seen my misery. Surely my husband will love me now. She conceived again, and when she gave birth to a son, she said, <laughs> because the Lord heard that I am not loved, he gave me this one too. So she named him Simeon. See what I'm saying? She just kept going on and on. Then it says, again, she conceived. And when she gave birth to a son, she said, now at last, my husband will become attached to me because I have borne him three sons. So he was named Levi. She conceived again, and when she gave birth to a son, she said, this time I will praise the Lord. So she named him Judah. Then she stopped having children. That's Genesis 29, 31 to 35. You would think at this point, she had the come to Jesus moment. She's ready to move on with her life. She sees her value. She knows her worth. She loves herself. She has the confidence. She has compassion. She has empathy. She has all of this. That is not what is going on. And then it says, when Rachel saw she was not bearing Jacob any children, she became jealous of her sister. But this was only what was going to what? End up being the end result of all of the scarcity mindset and the spirit of lack. And so it says, so she said to Jacob, give me children or I'll die. Now, how in the world do she think that just by her having children, that was going to be able to save her life? So she probably was in so much pain probably dealing with so much depression and heartache, et cetera, that she felt like either I'm going to have a baby or this is going to be the death of me. And sadly, having children was what ended up being the death of her because of the fact that when she was giving birth to Benjamin, she wanted to name him Benoni, 
that's when she ended up dying due to complications, major complications with childbirth, sadly, right? And it says, Jacob became angry with her and said, am I in the place of God who has kept you from having children? Then she said, here is Bilhah, my servant. Sleep with her so that she can bear children for me and I too can build a family through her. So she gave him her servant Bilhah as a wife. Jacob slept with her and she became pregnant and bore him a son. Then Rachel said, God has vindicated me. He has listened to my plea and given me a son. Because of this, she named him Dan. Rachel's servant Bilhah conceived again and then Jacob a second son. Then Rachel said, I have had a great struggle with my sister and I have won. So she named him Naphtali. How would you like to be named struggle after your parents' pain? <laughs> when Leah saw that she stopped having children, she took her servant Zilpah and gave her to Jacob as a wife. Leah's servant Zilpah bore Jacob a son. Then Leah said, what a good fortune. So she named him Gad. Leah's servant Zilpah bore Jacob a second son. Then Leah said, how happy I am. The women will call me happy. So she named him Asher. Leah was self-deceived, dealing with cognitive dissonance and trauma bonded and soul tied to Jacob and Rachel. Remember, they shared the same man. Jacob only loved Rachel. He happily married and had babies with the handmaids and with Leah, right? You have resorted to a narcissistic man who will either not marry you, but want to keep making babies with you that he halfway wants to take care of, or he has married you but really doesn't love you because of his narcissistic brokenness. He's having trouble loving anybody. Love equals being a good power supply and keep getting his side chicks, right? The side chicks pregnant in the process. And the side chicks are usually what? His coworkers, right? Nine times out of 10. And so because of your unworthiness, you stay and subject yourself to what? Disrespect a loss of dignity, et cetera, all for the sake of keeping his name. And it says in scripture, this is over in Isaiah 4 and 1. I forgot to write it down. I want to say it's 4 and 1. In that day, seven women will take hold of one man and say, we will eat our own food and provide our own clothes. Only let us be called by your name. Take away our disgrace. The only person that can take away our disgrace is Jesus himself. No other man, woman, no person, place, thing, or idea can do what? Can take the place of God. You are enough. Reclaim your power, soul, and identity and reclaim the power, soul, and identity of your calling. Grab your keys to the kingdom and get your inheritance. Again, I'm Katina Horton, the Love and Freedom Toxic Relationship Recovery Coach. Be blessed.